Hey folks, last time we built a powerlifting peaking program week one. This time we're going to learn how to run a peaking program for powerlifting, modifying the lifts week to week to week, tapering off the volume, deloading and then peaking so we can have as good of a powerlifting meet as possible, or even if you're not competing, as good of a gym mock meet as you possibly can. Let's get the basic setup going. We have five other videos previous to this one in the series, two on hypertrophy, two on strength, one on peaking. If you watch this video just by itself, you get something out of it. If you watch the other five videos or the more of them, the merrier, you get a ton out of it. So here we go. We're gonna talk about the sample program we built last time. We're gonna set the mesocycle length, relative effort progression, volume progression, or in this case, regression, how to deload and finish off the taper, and of course, what to do after the actual peak occurs. So here's the sample program. Feel free to pause and refamiliarize yourself. If you have absolutely no idea how the fuck we built this, check out the last video, the previous one in the series, and we go through and we build it manually step by step. Mesocycle length. We need to know how fast to progress, and mesocycle length has to determine that for us. It's really quite simple. However far you are from your next meet, that's how long the meso will be. Generally speaking, peaking is productive when it's done for between three and five weeks long, including its deload. The three weeks including deload may mean that you work hard for two weeks, deload, compete. Five weeks means you work hard, you build up in load for four weeks, down in volume, we'll get to that in a sec, and then you take a deload week and you go. All right, where you go within that range is meet scheduling. Let's say you finish a strength phase and you have four weeks left. Well, that's three up, one down. Uh, training age and recovery ability, trial and error if nothing else. Uh, but honestly, where your meet is, is going to be the huge determining factor in all of your other phases and how they line up. Can you peak for less than three weeks? You can, not ideal. Can you peak for longer than five? Ah, man, it's really just not sustainable to be training that heavy that long. And especially, it's not just not sustainable, you can sort of sort of string it out to where it makes sense, but then you probably would just be best doing less of that and more of an actual strength meso. Because remember, in the peaking phase, from a technical sports science perspective, we can't really say you're gaining a lot of strength. You're revealing your strength. So the gaining part is, uh, you know, that's really done in the strength phase. So if you have a lot of time to kill and you're like, I could do an eight week peaking phase, mm, maybe do a four week peaking phase and slap another four week strength mesocycle and you'll actually perform that much better because you'll get stronger. An eight week pe peaking phase just really rolls out the red carpet super slow until you compete, all right? So that's determined. Relative effort progression, pretty straightforward. If you've seen the strength and hypertrophy ones, you're gonna be used to this. But here's the thing. In the actual meso itself, in the accumulation, you will not hit an RP10. You are going to hit an RP9. So you start at RP7 in week one, and you progress to RP9 in that last week before deloading, usually. There are many exceptions to this. If you become very advanced, it could be two weeks out. If you're a super beginner, it could be the last week, and then you take half a deload and go. But this is on average for a good intermediate program, just the basics, and we can wiggle them later, all right? If this is the case, you almost never, in that last big effort before your meet, whether it be, usually we'll say it's one week out, you don't want to hit RP10. RP10 fatigues the living fuck out of you. You want to really be at super, super low fatigue for your actual competition. But contradictorily, to some extent, you want to have been exposed to ultra heavy stimulus and ultra heavy actual weight on the bar. RP9 offers the best of both worlds. RP10 is a great stimulus, but you may be too beat up and too fatigued. A lot of the great powerlifting champions of all times, they people have asked them, I've personally been one of the people to interview a bunch of great powerlifters and ask them a bunch of that is on uh, the Juggernaut um, Training Systems YouTube. We asked them, Look, what do you have any regrets or what do you think people should be doing now that you maybe screwed up when you were younger? And they say, you know what? A lot of them say I didn't deload enough, so on and so forth. But a lot of them will say I took way too many heavy ass singles too close to the meat I was going to do. 
And there's actually videos of some powerlifters hitting like for doubles what they ended up hitting for singles at the meet. You don't want to be one of those people because the meet is the only thing that really matters if you want to be great. The better you want to be, you know, can, can you imagine, like I'm sure you guys have met some of these people at powerlifting meets before. They hit like a certain like big squat in a meet, or decent squat, and they come up to you and you're like, dude, that was awesome. Like, yeah, hit that for a double, you know, two weeks ago. You're like, first of all, nobody gives a shit. Second of all, like, shut up, right? That just means you're a shitty programmer. So at the end of the day, actual peak will be RP10. You start at RP7-ish, work up however long you get to RP9, then deload, then RP10, not the other way around, right? Now, of course, you have to fill in the loads yourself to hit these RPE targets every, you know, the whole road between seven and nine. They'll say you could do maybe three weeks or four weeks to get there. Uh, could be seven, eight, nine, could be some doubles, could be fractional, 7.5, 8.5 RPE, however you like to do it. Just make sure roughly you're ascending in load and ascending in relative effort. And of course, the way to ascend in relative effort is to put more load on the bar. You're not going to be adding reps because that's way outside of the normal specificity. And you may actually be reducing repetitions. You may be starting with triples, going to doubles, and going to singles. That's a very good way to progress. So, you know, an RP7 triple is potentially way lighter than an RP8 double, which is way lighter than an RP9 single. So these are sometimes going to be pretty big load jumps, which is okay, just give your absolute best guess to what's going on. And because you usually get a couple of sets at these things. Uh, if your you know, first attempt at an RP9 single was like, yeah, that was really an RP8, then you can increase load a little bit for your second set. Uh, or if it was the other way around, if it was like, dude, that might've been like an RP9.75 or some shit, don't repeat that lift. Take weight off the bar and hit a real, you know, 8.5, 8.75 RP so that it's average out to nine, okay? Because it's not a good idea to just grind it. Because some people say like, oh, that was way too heavy. I'm like, all right, well, you got another set. Like, it was two sets today. They're like, yeah, I'll just repeat it. I'm like, oh, what are you doing? Then you're literally just asking to hit an RP 10. And then what are you going to do for the meet when you're too fatigued? Bad deal. Now, if you can't progress and load, you're really fucking something up. And it's a real big problem. If you hit MRV, maximum recovery volume, can't progress and load, you cannot and should not hit MRV in the middle or towards the end or any part of a peaking phase. The closest you come to MRV is actually in week one, and then all the volume drops off and the load goes up. So if you're so fatigued that you have trouble hitting your planned loads, you're in a bad spot and you need to rethink some things, right? So in a strength phase, yeah, you fucked up, not the end of the world. In a hypertrophy phase, this shit happens, right? You live and learn. In a peaking phase, good God. Err on the side of conservative load increases, conservative volume progressions, take more volume away than less because you really want that meat to go super well and a low fatigue state is the critical, critical key to doing that. Volume progression. In this case, is a misnomer. It's actually a regression. Why? Well, we have to reduce fatigue as we get closer and closer to the meat. At the meat, you want to be almost zero fatigue so that you really have all of your fitness. You're as strong as you've ever been. Strength is here or underlying ability to produce strength. And fatigue is here. That, that fitness strength minus fatigue, that's called preparedness. You want the highest possible preparedness, which means you want very low fatigue because that may, gives you that room. Cool thing, you have some assistance work in this plan that we designed, but in the last several weeks, you don't need assistance work because you can't lose an appreciable am amount of muscle if you're eating normally and not doing something insane or not sleeping, you can't really lose a ton of muscle that'll affect anything as far as strength in the last two weeks. So especially in the last two weeks, but generally the entire time, you can be reducing assistance volume, potentially getting rid of it altogether. That brings fatigue down like crazy. Don't worry about your muscle mass and it'll, it's going to allow you to keep maximum strength, lowest fatigue and express yourself really well. So the volume from the assistance work is going down. You essentially end up doing this. You start at somewhere between your minimum effective volume and maximum recoverable. We covered this in the last video, something that really fatigues you towards the end of the workout. And then you do less and less and less. So you reduce volume on assistance work until it's gone, probably gone right at that RP9 week. So that last heavy, hard training week before the deload, you probably want to do most people would want to do no assistance work there whatsoever. So that last week before is where it gets extracted completely. And on your technique work, you probably also want to reduce volume on your technique work so that it's just one set 
in that pre deload week. So that last week, RP9 week is going to have no assistance work for most people. And when you do your, uh, your super light technique work, it's just going to be one set at a time, like one set per session. That's almost nothing. Great. That's exactly what you need. That last week, you should be lifting ultra heavy loads. But at the end of that, you're like, you know, I feel pretty fucking good. And then you get a whole deal a week after that. What do you think is going to happen? Physiologically, psychologically, you're going to be like, oh my God, I wish Thanos would show up to my place with all that shit in his fucking hand. I'll punch that motherfucker in the face, squat bench and deadlift his ass into pieces, some Wanda Maximoff type shit. That's how you want to feel. Because a lot of people look forward to a taper and they're like, oh my God, I'm doing almost nothing. Good, good. You want to be pissed about that. Because if you come into a meet and someone's like, you're ready to squat, you're like, oh no, I'm feeling pretty beat up. Holy shit, did you fuck up? The volume taper is a weird idea to get used to, but it works. This is based on research from like many, many, many Olympic champions from 50 different sports, generations of stuff. It works. It's a big pill to swallow. Give it a shot. I've said that in other contexts. <laughs> All right. So here we go. Hopefully the videography on this works out, but... What we're going to do is progress week one, week two, and then week three. And I'm not going to talk about them much because you just have to see these alterations. What I want you to look for is set numbers. I want you to look for is all the loading and reps and exercise. Things are going to come out. Things are going to leave. Watch those volumes and those loads. So you're going to see a progression in load and you're going to see a regression in volume as we go from one week to the next to the next. Very different, but basically we have week one, week two, and then week three. It's a big difference. Now, pause and on your own time, take a look through all that. When you're done with it, we're going to look at week number four. So this is just a sample of a four week up, one week down peak. You can do them any other ways. Here, this is the pre deload week. This is the RP9 week. So as you can see, there's not a lot to display, which is why this is smaller, because where the hell, so first of all, the technique work is just down to one set, as promised, and where the hell is all that assistance work? It's gone, just like we said it would be. This, these are psychologically pretty difficult workouts because, fuck, you got three sets of low bar squat and the one to three rep range. Oftentimes, this is singles at this point. Not mandatory, but a good idea. At RP9, holy crap, and this crazy, crazy poundage, but then after that, everything's relatively easy. That's the point. That last week shouldn't really add to your fatigue. Shouldn't take it away, but it shouldn't really add to it. The entire time, your fatigue, so we, we basically have this table where volume is leaving, intensity is going up. That means our fatigue kind of just hangs around the same area, maybe goes down a little bit. That last week, not much happens, but because our fatigue never went up, it's at actually a pretty reasonable level. And then when we do the deload, the fatigue goes bloop and it's super low, which makes you really, really able to express yourself really well at the actual meet itself. Now, deloading before the peak is different than deloading for hypertrophy and for strength. A good approach is this, and there's many, many ways to skin this cat. Like I've said, I think in other videos, skinning a cat must be ter fucking terrible for the cat. Where are the animal rights activists not letting us say these things or should be triggered? So first half of the week, in a standard, typical, average, right? Good idea, maybe not the best for everyone. Good idea for the, for the average deload week before a meet is the first half of the week you do only technique lifting, right? Yep, sets of three to six at 70%, super, super easy. And then the second half of the week, mostly you just do nothing. You just rest. And you may think to yourself like, dude, I will be a psychotic animal by the end of this. Perfect. That's when we release you from your cage. And the only thing you see is red everywhere and a squat bar. And then we, you get the electric prodder after your three sets of squats, put you back in the cage, throw you peanut butter sandwiches. And then when the benches come out, we release you in the cage again, you do your bench, that whole idea, right? So it's very, very easy. Just in case you're confused of what that looks like, here's a sample. You'll notice Monday and Wednesday, it's really, really easy stuff. Two sets of just really, really compared to what we were doing in the in the entire peaking meso before this, this is just chump change. You'll feel like, oh yeah, I'm like feeling my swag a little bit. Like this is cool. Like I feel like I'm lifting, but I'd love to go heavy, but I'm not allowed to. Then you leave the gym, pretty frustrated. Then Thursday you rest, Friday, so Saturday here uh, is your, your actual meet. 
Friday, you may choose to come in and just do a few sets of each lift, squat, bench, deadlift, with the just the bar, or if you're really strong, up to like 135 pounds for just triples, just to feel out that groove, shake the rust off a little bit, a little bit of technical practice on Friday can pay the tiniest but notable dividends for you on Saturday. Just have an extra crisp groove and get that five more, two and a half pound more PR on your bench or whatever than you wanted to, or sorry, than you, than you could have without this, but totally optional. It's totally optional. And, and no one's really even sure if it's a better idea for powerlifting. In weightlifting, it is absolutely a better idea because technique is so super important. In powerlifting, if you said, hey, how important is that Friday? Because like that Friday, I'm actually driving the whole day or I'm at the hotel chilling and I have other lifters that are they're on my team. I don't have access to equipment. I'd have to drive away to a gym. They don't set up the powerlifting meet until Saturday. Should I really be lifting? Fuck no. Super optional. I can't even tell you it's going to be for sure a good idea. But if you feel like you really need something, this is the most you should do. I'll put it to you like that. Now, you watch all these videos we filmed, all the six videos you put together, this crazy program, you PR by a trillion pounds and everything, you kill Thanos, also you do a powerlifting meet. What do you do after the meet, okay? First, at least take a deload week after the meet, if you really need to get in the gym and lift some stuff. Preferably a week of active rest where you just fuck off and nobody sees you. Like, hey, I heard that, that lifter from our gym did a competition this past Saturday. How'd it go? People are like, it was pretty well. Have you seen him around us Thursday? Like, no, I think he quit the sport. <laughs> He's just never coming back to the gym. Good. Let people think that. Leave the gym for at least one week, maybe two if you're really beat up. Because after a real hardcore powerlifting you meet, you have this like, like you're really happy. They give you a trophy. You know, you you finally, you know, propose to your loving fiance or whatever happens at powerlifting meets. And then you are feeling there's like totally toast. Some of you guys have competed before, you know, like you wake up the day after meet and you're like, did I get hit by a truck last night? We started drinking after the meet. I don't remember. They're like, nope, nope, just the meat. Right, your back will feel weird. Your shoulders will feel weird. You have all these little, uh, these little pings and nicks everywhere. You may, after a week, feel a thousand percent, or not. Like if you're squatting, benching, and deadlifting hundreds and hundreds of six, seven hundred, eight hundred pounds, eh, two weeks, man, two weeks. So at least a week, preferably two of active rest. Then you ease in to a strength or hypertrophy phase after. How do you do a strength hypertrophy phase? We got videos on that right in this very playlist. But super big last caveat before I let you guys go. Here's, well, actually, you can just click stop and get the fuck out anytime you want. I feel like I'm still a professor with actual students that we can help, you know, hold captive in a classroom. Last thing, ease in means ease in. Do not go in after a week of active rest in a fucking month of low volume and start doing sets of 10 four or five sets and get ultra pumped, ultra sore, crush yourself, possibly get hurt. Don't do that. When you come back after like, let's say you took the, let's say you did the full Monty. You did a five week peak, the last three weeks of which are unreal low volume. And you did two weeks of active rest. So what is that? Like five weeks of barely anything you could call training. You're untrained, okay? More or less. That first week should be like two sets of five on basic derivatives for hypertrophy, like close grip bench, high bar squat, deficit deadlift, two sets of five, seven RPE, fucking easy shit, shut it down, leave, no extra assistance work. You will get pumped. You will get sore and hopefully you recover on time. The next half of the week, you know, two to three sets of five. Then the week two, maybe three, three sets of five, maybe sets of six, et cetera, et cetera. Then through that whole first mesocycle, you build from sets of like five, even three to five, up to sets of five to 10. Your volume grows as you're able to recover more and more. So that first cycle, be it strength or hypertrophy, when you come back, has to have that easing in component. If you just go straight into the teeth, you're going to get fucked up and you might get hurt and you're not going to get a whole lot out of it. I've made this mistake like 10 trillion times myself. Here's the thing. The biggest factor with this mistake is you're so fucking ready to train. You so much want to beat your own ass because for five weeks, yeah, you've been winning powerlifting meets, but you really haven't been training all that hard. You just can't wait. Be easy. Ease in. It's the easiest gains you'll ever make in your life. Take them because doing more up front has only downsides and no upsides. Folks, Thanks for tuning in. Hopefully this whole video series makes a bunch of sense. We'll be back next week with more videos that hopefully also make sense. But in case they don't, I've been Mike Isertel. 
For Renaissance Periodization, see you next time.